As the jeep approached the grand entrance of the Gulf Coast, Chief Uzor's mobile phone began to ring, filling the air with its melodic tone. Raising the phone to his ear, he greeted the caller, Mr. Rotomi, in a friendly manner. Curiosity piqued. Chief Uzor inquired about the reason for the call, to which Rotomi replied with respect and politeness. He explained that he had something of tremendous importance to discuss, but preferred to do so in person, a request Chief Uzor readily granted. Amusingly, the chief teased Rotimi about whether they were setting up another interview. However, Rotimi insisted that this matter surpassed a mere interview in significance. Acknowledging the gravity of the situation, Chief Uzor agreed to meet at the Gulf Coast, a luxurious retreat known to be frequented only by the country's wealthiest individuals. After a brief drive, the police vehicle carrying Inspector Lucky, Officer Audu, and Rotimi pulled up at the Gulf Coast. The serene atmosphere of the place provided a stark contrast to the perplexing topic they were about to discuss. Ignoring the allure of joining friends, Chief Uzor chose to sit alone at a shaded table for three, occupied with his mobile phone and ongoing business dealings. The trio of guests, Rotimi, Inspector Lucky and Officer Audu, soon joined him, taking their seats. Once Chief Uzor concluded his phone conversation, Rotimi wasted no time delving into the matter at hand. The journalist introduced Inspector Lucky and Officer Audu, receiving warm compliments from the chief for the policeman's commendable reputation. The conversation eventually gravitated to the bizarre deaths in Lugba, which had caught Chief Uzor's attention through the media. Inspector Lucky confirmed that they sought the chief's opinion on the matter, prompting Chief Uzor to wonder why his insights were needed. As Rotomi explained the involvement of an enigmatic writer who seemed to predict events before they unfolded, Chief Uzor initially dismissed the idea, attributing the writer's detailed accounts to a vivid imagination. However, he grew intrigued as Rotomi elaborated on the writer's uncanny accuracy, describing events that had not yet been publicly disclosed. As Chief Uzor read the segment of the story that mentioned him, his amazement and fear were palpable. He became anxious about the writer's ability to describe his private experiences with such precision. Inspector Lucky and Officer Audu shared their astonishment, expressing a desire to locate and speak with this mysterious writer. Chief Uzor, now sweating and consumed with thoughts of the morning's news and the butchered cops, wondered why he was drawn into the story. Yearning to learn more about the strange tale, Chief Uzor listened as Rotimi recounted the details of the story from the beginning, raising questions about the medallion and connections to an NGO. The mention of a young man named Ekeni and a woman named Edna Aja particularly caught his attention, causing him to react with intense interest. Determining that they needed to reach out to the writer, Chief Uzor instructed Rotimi to do everything possible to locate this enigmatic individual. He was determined to meet the writer face to face, sensing that this encounter might hold the key to unraveling the mystery that had suddenly entangled his life. As Rotimi received a private message from the writer with a contact number, the three men looked at each other with renewed curiosity and determination. The quest to find the elusive writer and uncover the truth had become their shared mission. That evening, the chief monk called for Odeon, requesting his presence alone. As Odeon entered the room, he could sense the gravity of the situation. The chief monk wasted no time in getting to the point. He asked the younger monk to get himself prepared, as will be leaving for Uyo the next day. Observing the perplexed expression on the young monk's face, he quickly reassured Odeon not to be afraid and remember that they were counting on him. The fate of the entire world depended on this mission. Odeon was asked to just take charge and follow the instructions of the gods. He was made to understand that he was only meant to be a guide and nothing more. In Uyo, he will meet a young, intelligent man, a budding writer. His task was to locate him and share his wisdom and knowledge of Gaul, the malevolent entity capable of unspeakable atrocities. Every monk at the monastery possessed profound knowledge of Gaul, 
having dedicated much of their lives to studying and keeping this malevolent force away from mankind. Safeguarding the world from Gaul's influence was their sacred mission, the very purpose of their monastery. With the chief monk's guidance complete, Odeon humbly bowed and exited the room, knowing that he had to prepare himself for the momentous journey ahead. The weight of the world now rested on his shoulders, and he understood the importance of his role in confronting the malevolence that threatened humanity. After leaving his blood-stained room, Clifford's mind was set on finding a secluded spot to have a private conversation with Ghoul. He recognized Ghoul's anxiety and the necessity for both of them to have some alone time to discuss their concerns. The bond between them had grown stronger, and Clifford harbored a deep affection for his enigmatic companion, wishing for their connection to be everlasting. However, he sensed Gaul's discomfort, an unsettling feeling that gnawed at him as they now existed like intertwined twins sharing a singular existence. Stepping away from his familiar surroundings, Clifford's thoughts drifted to the recent brutal act he had committed, taking the lives of the police officers. The emotions he experienced afterwards were akin to an artist's satisfaction after creating a masterpiece, and he harbored the unsettling hope that Gaul might urge him to commit such acts again. As he walked toward a remote corner of Lugbur, an area marked by abandoned, incomplete buildings, he reflected on the dormant housing project known as the Housing for the Masses, an ironic endeavor by the government that stood as unfinished shells without roofs. Within the confines of one of these abandoned structures, Clifford voiced his thoughts aloud, seeking Gaul's guidance. Gaul's voice resonated in his mind, commanding him to focus on finding the stolen medallion, an item of paramount importance to Gaul's existence. However, Clifford revealed that the medallion had been taken by someone unknown. The dialogue between them revealed that Clifford's daughter had been present when he concealed the medallion, and his heart seized with a sudden realization he could potentially use Gaul's power to locate her. Clifford's excitement met silence from Gaul, an unsettling stillness that hinted at something amiss. Attempting to harness Gaul's abilities to find his missing daughter, Clifford found himself met with resistance. Gaul suggested that his enemies had manipulated the situation, causing a ripple effect that affected even Ghoul's existence. Tensions surged within Clifford as Ghoul's words resonated. Gaul further explained that his powers were tethered to the medallion, now distant and unreachable, due to the distortion. The symbiotic relationship they shared was compromised. The smoky form Gaul assumed in this world was a mere shadow of his true power. As time passed, Gaul's strength would wane, rendering him powerless. Clifford's inquiry about Gaul's adversaries was met with silence, leaving him unsettled. However, Gaul disclosed his counter-strategy using the plan against them. Gaul's enemies aimed to prolong his search for the medallion, banking on the writer's creativity to keep it far from Gaul's reach. To counter this, Gaul required Clifford's help to locate the storyteller, a person integral to the medallion's retrieval. Perplexed but willing, Clifford pledged his commitment to assist Gaul. Their shared thoughts and similar perspectives facilitated their collaboration, minimizing Gaul's need for persuasion. Gaul stressed that Clifford's role as a host would preserve his energy, ensuring that Gaul's power wouldn't diminish rapidly. A symbiotic partnership was the key to their success. With a newfound purpose and determination, Clifford acknowledged his role as Gaul's energy conserver. The overwhelming sense of contentment he derived from this mysterious alliance overshadowed any doubts or questions he might have had. Gaul's command prompted Clifford to nourish himself, emphasizing the need for strength. Furthermore, they sought a suitable location for rest, a place where Gaul could delve into his contemplations regarding the storyteller. Clifford's compliance with Gaul's guidance was unwavering. He embraced his role with eagerness, convinced that being a host to Gaul was the pinnacle of his existence. The prospect of living intertwined with this otherworldly being overshadowed every other concern. As the day transitioned into night, Clifford found solace in their partnership, 
ready to fulfill whatever role Gaul had in mind for him, 